Hello and welcome to a uh, presentation uh, for beginning pathology residents covering some of the basic uh, types of colon polyps. Uh, this is intended as a tutorial session uh, for those who want to learn the differential features uh, for some of the most commonly encountered colon polyps. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel and this uh, program is made possible by uh, the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy. Uh, which is a project in co collaboration between the Digital Pathology Association and uh, Path Presenter, as well as uh, my wonderful employer, the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. So uh, we'll begin. This is module one, uh, some covering some of the basics of colon polyps, and we hope there will be several modules to follow. So first of all, it's important to understand that normal colonic mucosa has uh, a lot of similarities, but also some uh, key differences that allow one to, uh, uh, at least in some general terms, uh, detect whether we're proximal or more distal. Uh, and these changes in composition and uh, features are important in some disease states. Uh, for example, uh, uh, PANF cells are typically seen in the cecum and maybe ascending colon, uh, but they're pretty well gone. Uh, once you pass the ascending colon and when seen uh, elsewhere are an indication of some sort of an abnormality. Likewise, uh, lymphoid tissue and plasma cells in the lamina propria, aside from lymphoid aggregates, also decrease as we progress more distally uh, in the colon. And as we reach the rectum, it's very common to find some shortening of the crypts um, and slight uh, architectural disarray. Uh, goblet cells uh, tend to be relatively common or constant uh, throughout the uh, the uh, colon. So just to illustrate this uh, these features, here's a nice uh, example of uh, normal ascending colonic mucosa. Uh, we see here a few uh, uh, PANF cells here in the base of these crypts, uh, and we see a fairly uh, healthy number of uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells in the lamina propria. Uh, the surface is fairly uniform and uh, all of the glands come down here and touch the muscularis mucosa. As we move more distally in the colon, as you can see here, uh, the number of uh, plasma cells and lymphocytes has uh, decreased. We no longer have any of the uh, uh, PANF cells in, in any of the crypts here, um, and so this uh, represents something that would be uh, ascending through sigmoid colon type of uh, topography. Moving into the rectum, uh, we will more frequently see some uh, evidence of, of lymphoid aggregates, um, and uh, occasionally we'll see some uh, shortening of these glands. As you see here, there are a few of them that don't quite reach the uh, muscularis mucosa, uh, and that's uh, more frequent as we uh, find uh, more tissue in the rectum. These uh, uh, crypts are fairly closely spaced, oftentimes in the rectum, they can become more widely spaced as well. <clears throat> so there's some basics. Uh, we'd like to then talk about serrated architecture. Uh, this comes from the, uh, uh, the uh, sur undulating surface that is uh, common in uh, uh, various uh, knives, uh, bread knives and other sorts of things uh, that tend to cut uh, in a more uh, distinct architecture or distinct uh, pattern. Um, but this serrated architecture is a feature that can be found in several different types of uh, colon lesions and therefore presents a little bit of a problem in differential diagnosis. So we'll start with the sessile serrated adenoma or lesion, uh, as it's been more recently uh, termed. Uh, these are most commonly seen in the right colon, but may occur on the left side. They're usually larger than five millimeters in size, and they tend to have a proliferation zone that is above the base of the crypt. This results then in dilatation of the gland, deep glandular tissue, and that can lead to sort of so-called boot-shaped crypts or uh, Charlie Chaplin feet uh, heading out in both directions as opposed to uh, ballerina feet, uh, pointy toe kind of outlines, and also leads to the fact that the crypts tend to be parallel and the, and the polyp contours are sessile and elongated rather than wedge-shaped, uh, which would one would associate with a hyperplastic polyp. Most sessile serrated adenomas or lesions tend to lack uh, cellular dysplasia, uh, 
but it can be present and its presence should not uh, uh, dissuade one from the possibility that a lesion is a, truly a serrated uh, polyp. Now I've got several uh, glass or several uh, slide examples uh, to allow uh, you to uh, get familiar with these features. Um, and these slides are all annotated in the, in the presentation. So if you'd like to come back to these slides later and view the presentation, I would encourage you to do so uh, to review these features. So um, here we see um, some variable size. It seems to be several millimeters in length in these several polyps. Um, it's not wedge-shaped. You can see that these are fairly uniform. And the serrated architecture is uh, what we're seeing right here, this undulating surface in and out, up and down, indentations and so forth. Uh, you can get all sorts of interesting shapes uh, if you look and focus on the clear space in these uh, glands, everything from stars to uh, running men to uh, snowmen and so forth. Um, and then we see the other feature that we tend to see here is, is that the deeper portions of the gland start to dilate, they start to spread out. Uh, here's one that's pointed, but uh, just a few doors down, we see uh, almost uniform dilatation of, from top to bottom of the gland. This is characteristic of a, a serrated uh, lesion. Uh, looking at other areas in this polyp, we can see here the uh, boot shape, sort of upside down as the toes stick out to one side and here's the other side coming together. Um, when these uh, come together, we uh, refer to it as Charlie Chaplin feet. Now the other thing to note is that uh, sometimes our orientation is a little bit challenging. So for example, uh, in this slide, this area of the slide, we have a surface up here and we have a surface down here and we don't know what's a deep dilatation and what's uh, superficial. Um, and again, here you see this, the complexity of the uh, epithelium. Uh, here's a, you know, kind of a centipede type of shape in the, in the uh, glandular lumen. So we'll just take a look at some of the uh, annotations. Um, here we see highlighting the length of these lesions. Um, and here we'll go to a boot-shaped uh, gland, as we saw before. You can see the boot shapes here, uh, highlighting that these crypts are abnormal. Well, let's go on to another slide, another example. Here again, we see a, a long, mostly flat uh, lesion. Uh, but as we look at it here, we can see that there's some complexity to the uh, glandular architecture. And we can see this serrated pattern quite easily. Sometimes it's present throughout the, the gland and sometimes it's more focused towards the surface, occasionally just involving barely the surface. So you have to be alert for that. Uh, we note here that there begin to be a few areas such as we see right here, uh, where mucin is, uh, the mucin goblet cells are decreased. Uh, and this may be an area of beginning dysplasia. Here we can see some uh, uh, piling up of the nuclei and so forth. Um, and so that's a feature that we can see uh, in these uh, serrated lesions as well. Here we see the glands sort of bifurcating and dilating in the deep portions of the gland. Now these dilated deep glands may be fairly localized. And so here, most of these glands are not localized, but right here, we have several glands that are slightly dilated and more complex in the base. And that is sufficient uh, in the appropriate setting to make the diagnosis of a serrated uh, adenoma or lesion. Looking on to another example here, uh, here we can see uh, again, at uh, sort of intermediate magnification, this uh, un undulating serrated type of surface. Here's uh, a nice example of that uh, right here uh, in these glands. Uh, looking opposite, however, we see that there is a little bit more complexity here and these glands begin to become more confluent. Um, and here, note that here is an area of hyperchromasia. 
So this again can be the beginnings of uh, dysplastic changes uh, in these uh, serrated uh, polyps. Here we see nice uh, branching, boot-shaped uh, appearing uh, glands at the base uh, with dilatation. And again, over here. So this would be a sessile serrated uh, lesion or adenoma, um, potentially with focally uh, developing low-grade dysplasia. Here we see, again, more of this nice deep glandular dilatation uh, characteristic of these lesions and the branching in both directions. One final example. Um, again, we see flat lesion, generally parallel uh, glands, some deep dilatation, serrated epithelial architecture, this is a sessile serrated adenoma or lesion. Now, in contrast to these are the hyperplastic polyps. And these are usually only found in the distal sigmoid and rectum. They're most often smaller than five millimeters. And in fact, I tell our surgeons and that if they look at a report, uh, if they see uh, a hyperplastic polyp in the right colon, uh, they should be suspect that they may be dealing with something else. Uh, in these cases, the lesions tend to be wedge-shaped. In other words, the sur surface contour is wider uh, than the base. Uh, the small, uh, narrow crypts at the, at the base uh, have been likened to ballerina feet with very, very pointed toes, and these are not associated with dysplasia. If there's dysplasia, it is not a hyperplastic polyp. So here's a few uh, simple examples. Uh, here's one very small localized lesion, less than a few millimeters in size, serrated architecture. Uh, now in this situation, uh, we don't know uh, what the base looks like. We don't see the muscularis mucosa here, and so we can't see what the crypts look like abutting that. Um, assuming this is uh, a lesion from the rectum, then um, I would render a diagnosis as serrated uh, lesion or serrated polyp favor hyperplastic type uh, based on location and size uh, and the known recognition that I haven't uh, seen the full base of the lesion. Looking for another example, here is another example. Uh, again, a fairly small lesion. This is the entire lesion. This is not a nice wedge-shaped uh, lesion. Uh, but the, the deep crypts are, are pointed, they're, they're uh, uniformly uh, directed, and we can see here there's just a very subtle uh, undulation. This is not in well-focused and scanned slide, but you can see this undulating, slightly serrated surface uh, that is characteristic of a, uh, any of the serrated polyps. Here's another area over here with a serrated uh, contour to that surface. Uh, so it's a subtle uh, example, not perhaps a classic one, but within the realm uh, that it should be called a hyperplastic polyp. Now here's an instructive example, another uh, lesion. Um, and this is one that uh, seems small, uh, seems to uh, narrow towards the base. Uh, here's a more normal colorectal mucosa here without any polypoid changes. Um, and so a lesion like this, small in the appropriate location, could easily be called a uh, uh, hyperplastic polyp. However, uh, on deeper sectioning and further evaluation, this was found to have some deeper glandular dilatation here and uh, was reclassified as a serrated uh, lesion or serrated polyp. So we see the difficulty. This is a a difficult area to uh, be ironclad in one's diagnosis, especially if one doesn't have all of the, the classic features. And that's where a, an intermediate diagnosis such as serrated lesion, uh, favor, uh, but can't, or can't rule out uh, uh, sort of uh, situation uh, could be an appropriate diagnosis.
because these can be problematic lesions. And of course, the follow-up will be dramatically different uh, based on whether or not there's a serrated adenoma, which has a premalignant risk versus a hyperplastic polyp. So the other uh, lesion with uh, serrated in its name is the traditional serrated adenoma. Um, and these again have a slightly uh, different uh, morphology. And so the differential diagnosis is different than the hyperplastic and sessile serrate serrated polyps. Uh, this lesion is most commonly confused with a villus adenoma. And that's because these are usually left-sided and they do have a complex villiform uh, architecture. They're usually large um, and uh, composed of eosinophilic, not usually dysplastic lesions, but sometimes you can develop dysplasia in these lesions. One of the uh, most helpful free features to find is the presence of these ectopic crypts or micro crypts that are oriented along the villus fronds. Um, while the, I'm not saying that these are never seen in other lesions, this is perhaps the most useful uh, type of lesion. And in these lesions, you can get both conventional type adenomatous dysplasia as well as so-called serrated type dysplasia as well. So let's uh, look at some examples of these lesions and see how they may classify differently. So here we see uh, microscopic sections of a fairly good sized lesion. Um, and we can see it's got some, some very long villiform uh, lesions. Uh, we can see in this main portion that it's got a stalk um, and it's got uh, sort of a very mucinous appearance. And then look here at this, uh, this sort of a pattern here. So here we see this very undulating surface, but it's a little different than the serrated pattern we saw in the sessile serrated lesion. Um, looking uh, a little bit more fully over here, we can see this is one of these villus fronds, and all along this are all of these little indentations where each one of these indentations is uh, essentially a small crypt. Um, and as we go to higher magnification, we can see that, that, that this has sort of a typical crypt morphology in each of the base of these lesions. Um, so these um, little micro crypts or ectopic crypts along the fronds of these uh, villus uh, projections are the characteristic uh, feature of a sessile serrated adenoma, excuse me, of a ser traditional serrated adenoma. Now looking a little bit further at this case, we'd want to then ask the question, is there any evidence of dysplasia? So in this fragment over here, we see nice mucinous epithelium. We don't see features that look like dysplasia. Uh, and this lesion is sort of cauterized, and so uh, sometimes that can look or begin to look like uh, nuclear stratification and dysplasia, and so that becomes a little bit more problematic for uh, evaluation. Uh, however, in the absence of unequivocal dysplastic changes, one would classify this as a traditional serrated adenoma uh, without evidence of, without unequivocal evidence of dysplasia. Let's go on and look at another example. Again, here's a fairly good sized lesion, not as tall or complex as the previous lesion, but we see up here that there's the beginnings of uh, some villus type architecture uh, as these uh, uh, lesions begin to become elongated. Here, however, um, you know, we wanna first establish, is this a traditional serrated adenoma or is it a, a sessile serrated adenoma? Um, here's some areas where it's a little bit more complex and could be a, tr a, a usual sessile serrated adenoma. Uh, here's a little bit of deep glandular dilatation over here. Um, but here we're, we are seeing these uh, villus elongations. And I'll just point these out right here. See this deep crypt, some of these deep lesions here. These are the ectopic microcrypts uh, that one uh, sees in traditional serrated adenoma. This lesion is a little bit more complicated because uh, lo and behold, right here, we have some uh, conventional dysplasia developing. Again, it's not well in focus there, uh, but over here, uh, 
we can again see more of this dysplasia happening. And here we're beginning to see sort of a cribriform type of architecture uh, in this uh, lesion, more of that right here. So we're beginning to develop uh, d dysplasia, uh, almost towards high grade dysplasia uh, in some of these areas. But as we look around, we again see areas where we have these uh, ectopic uh, crypts. Well, I'm looking for one, I'm not finding it right here. Um, so we'll go back over here and see that here we do have these little micro crypts, little downward undulations where uh, the uh, cells begin to form a small crypt. There's a very good example right there. Uh, we'll just highlight that one uh, to illustrate that micro crypt formation. So this lesion we would then call a traditional serrated adenoma with areas of uh, conventional dysplasia, focally approaching high-grade uh, dysplasia. Now, one further example, um, when the dysplasia has become very widespread, uh, these lesions look very much like a uh, villus adenoma or a villoglandular adenoma. So uh, in, in, let's, uh, look here at this villus architecture and see what features are here to say that this is a traditional serrated adenoma. Well, first of all, looking right here, we see this villus frond with a small microcrypt right here, a couple of them opposite each other. So those crypts along the villus uh, frond would lead us to think that this is a traditional serrated adenoma. Now looking over here, we can see more of these sorts of uh, lesions, it's more of these sorts of uh, uh, ectopic crypts. Here's one, here's one, here's one uh, along these villus fronds. Now, the next question, once you've established that it's a traditional serrated adenoma, would be, is it dysplastic? And uh, looking again here, we see we've got areas where there's loss of mucin. We've got nuclear stratification and enlargement. Uh, we've got coarsening of the nuclear chromatin. So we are developing dysplasia in this lesion. This is beginning to be a low-grade dysplastic lesion. And notice here, there's, there's still the residua of an ectopic crypt. Now, the next question, if you've got dysplasia, uh, is you wanna say, is there something worse than dysplasia? Do we have uh, potentially something worse? Well, uh, we'll focus here. And here, I think we would say, uh, this begins to look like high-grade dysplasia. We've got a complex glandular architecture, nearly solid growth uh, present in this lesion. And in addition, within the lumen here, we're beginning to get necrotic debris. So this is uh, looking like uh, in situ carcinoma or uh, high-grade dysplasia, essentially equivalent terms in the large bowel. Then you wanna ask the question, well, is there something worse than that? And yes, right here, as is conveniently located near the dot, we see that we have here uh, the development of an early stromal invasion, or an inflammatory response. We have uh, single cells budding off uh, of this area out into the stroma. So we have an early invasive adenocarcinoma developing in a traditional serrated adenoma with both low and high grade dysplasia. Uh, a wonderful example of the full spectrum of disease that can be seen uh, with these traditional serrated adenomas. Well, I said that uh, these lesions could be uh, con confused with uh, uh, tubular or villus adenoma. Let's talk about the most common and most frequently encountered adenoma of the colon, the tubular adenoma. Uh, this lesion is defined by the presence of dysplastic cellular changes, uh, which are really based on finding cigar-shaped nuclei and some degree of pseudostratification in the epithelium. Um, occasionally, I've noted that uh, we will find increased mucin in the adjacent crypts without evidence of dysplasia, um, but often in these dysplastic areas and the at tubular adenomas, there is loss of cellular mucin, although uh, mucin retaining types are also seen. Uh, we then see architectural changes, which consist of glandular enlargement, 
and distortion of the glands, irregular shapes, uh, but principally enlargement. These changes tend to be seen first at the surface, at the bowel surface, and then extend more deeply into the crypts as they progress. Another feature which I find helpful um, and may be a, uh, an artifact, but I think it's a fairly useful artifact, is that this adenomatous epithelium is more brittle. And so when it sections, it tends to shatter. And seeing that shattering artifact in comparison to normal glands can oftentimes be helpful, particularly if your histology is not the best. Um, so here's a uh, section of colon biopsies. And as we look at this, we see, uh, well, there's lots of uh, normal glands here. Um, we can say that we're not in the uh, cecum or ascending colon. We've got a moderate number of uh, cells, no paneth cells and so forth. But looking a little bit more closely, what do we behold right here? It just looks different, doesn't it? It jumps out at us. It's a little bluer. It's a little bit bigger. And as we look at higher magnification, we see here the nuclei are basally located. They're slightly round. Here the nuclei, they're like little elongated cigars. And they're crowded up. They're cramped. Uh, and so this crypt, uh, and maybe its uh, extension down here, is involved by an early tubular adenoma or early dysplastic change. Is there a little bit more further on? There could be. Now this highlights uh, one of the features that is also important to remember in managing these cases, and that is that these lesions can be very focal and can sometimes be missed with traditional sectioning. And so if you have a good endoscopist who is astute and seeing things, and they say there's a polyp there and you don't see it on your sections, then it may be a little bit deeper into the block. And so we uh, usually will section more deeply if it's going to make a difference in management, such as if it's the only lesion that he has uh, resected. Here's another case. Uh, in this case, we can see there's uh, some abnormal glandular tissue here. We even see a little different color to this uh, epithelium here. Uh, we see some stromal hemosiderin here. Uh, here we see an enlarged, uh, distorted gland. And again, we see there's mucins retained here, but there's, again, this stratification uh, of these uh, cells here. Looking at these other polyps, these other fragments, we can see again right here um, a slightly different gland. See how it stands out next to the normal glands? And here's one here. Now, when I talked about the shatter artifact, this is what I'm talking about. Notice how these glands have this cracking, shattering artifact. And this one right next to it and over here have less of that. This is the uh, brittleness of these uh, cells that can sometimes be useful in identifying uh, these lesions. One more example. Um, again, colon biopsy. We see even at this very, very minimal magnification, we can see that right here, there's an area where things look bluer things look different than the surrounding tissue. Now this is actually uh, somewhat villous architecture because it's taken from the terminal ilium. Um, but I point that out because you can detect this change oftentimes at very low magnification. Uh, so here are our features. We can see the paneth cells of the normal terminal ilium. And here we see the altered glands with stratification of the nuclei uh, some karyorectic debris as well, um, and a little bit of hyperchromasia to the nuclei and uh, cellular and especially nuclear enlargement in this area. Dysplastic gland, normal gland. More normal gland, dysplastic glands along the surface. So that nicely summarizes the tubular adenoma and how uh, subtle changes can be seen even at low magnification. Now, as uh, this dysplastic process uh, progresses, uh, we can develop additional uh, architectural features uh, that have been termed a tubular villus and villus adenoma. These are different, only, different from a tubular adenoma only in the portion of the lesion that shows 
villus architecture. So if we are 25% villus architecture, we would say tubulo villus architecture, tubulo villus adenoma. If it's exclusively villus, uh, then we would say villus adenoma. Uh, and the distinction is not particularly important because they're both high grade lesions, high, excuse me, they're both higher risk lesions, both more advanced adenomatous lesions, and high grade dysplasia and invasive carcinoma uh, are more frequently seen in these than they are with uh, simple tubular adenomas. So let's take a look at a couple examples. Here's one from a resection specimen. Uh, we see the muscle wall over here on the left, uh, submucosa with some lymphoid aggregates. And then we see this uh, surface uh, proliferation, uh, and we see it's a, a mixture here of uh, both sort of tubular glands, uh, as you see here, and some more uh, villus type projections, such as we see here, uh, and to a limited degree here. So uh, while this could be called just a tubular adenoma, because it's got a little bit of villus architecture, calling it a tubular villus architect, uh, adenoma helps to communicate the fact uh, that it's a little bit more advanced. Now, uh, as we looked at with the traditional serrated adenoma, if you begin to see this, the next question then becomes, do we have any areas of high-grade dysplasia? Um, and with high-grade dysplasia, we're looking for uh, more areas of uh, architectural change where it begins to resemble invasive carcinoma uh, or resemble uh, in situ carcinoma, as it were, um, where you lose more of the mucin, where the architecture becomes more cribriform, or where you begin to find areas of uh, necrosis. And here, while we begin to see maybe a little tiny suggestion of cribriforming in this pattern here, I don't think it's enough for us to call this uh, high-grade dysplasia. So this is a pure tubulovillus adenoma uh, that has been resected uh, to uh, eliminate the risk of development of invasion, invasive neoplasia. So let's look at another example, again, a resection specimen. Uh, and here we see, uh, you know, we've got uh, a little bit of uh, uh, villus architecture here. Um, elongated uh, villi crypts with some branching. So it's really still in the sort of tubular villus uh, category, um, unless we believe that the villus architecture predominates. Now, one of the unique features of this slide is it has a little incidental finding here. We see some solid growth, and we would of course want to look at this in more uh, detail, uh, but here we see um, an unusual finding in the presence of a sort of squamous morular type metaplasia in this lesion. Uh, this is not a frequent finding, does not have a specific carcinomatous uh, implication. It's just a, an atypical uh, uh, histologic anomaly, if you will, that's part of the dysplasia and part of that proliferative process. Here we'd want to again look carefully to see do we have areas of high grade dysplasia. And so these solid areas would, of course, immediately attract our attention. Are, are these uh, high-grade dysplasia? Um, but in fact, we see that the nuclear features here are very bland. Um, it's just a more morular or squamous type metaplasia. Now, we, we would also, of course, want to exclude the fact, uh, exclude a neuroendocrine uh, proliferation in this situation as well, because uh, combined um, uh, adeno neuroendocrine uh, type of lesions can be seen as well. But in this case, we look along the muscularis mucosa. We see it's a nice smooth band here, um, all along here. Uh, it comes around over here, and we see, again, fairly nicely defined muscularis mucosa without evidence of the disruption or invasion of that. So let's talk more about high-grade dysplasia. Um, this is very important because we want to make sure we identify it and follow up uh, so that the patient can get a complete excision. Now, this is essentially an equivalent term to intramucosal carcinoma. Uh, we use that term in the esophagus, but not uh, typically in the colon. Uh, high-grade dysplasia is predominantly defined by the architecture, uh, not by the nuclear features. It tends to have solid or cribriform growth patterns. 
It may have microinvasion into the lamina propria with small single cells. It may have incomplete glands and the presence of a tumor diathesis, in other words, luminal type of inflammatory and necrotic debris. So let's look at an example of that in this particular slide. Uh, here we see, um, again, predominantly villus architecture with a little bit of branching. Um, and we can see here's kind of the normal baseline uh, architecture of a uh, low-grade dysplasia. Still some retention of the mucin in this particular sort of situ situation. Then contrast that architecture with what we see right here, and we can immediately see that there's a degree of hyperchromasia, there's a degree of loss of uh, uh, villus st structure that uh, uh, tends to suggest something different, something more severe. And in fact, uh, the cytologically, these cells are a little bit more coarse, the NC ratio has increased, Myt mitoses have increased, and we see in the lumen, we begin to see this sort of grungy, dirty, uh, nuclear debris kind of diathesis uh, present. Uh, we can also see areas of sort of uh, hyperpapillarity in some areas. And then with that, we'd want to ask the question, do we have any evidence of invasion? Now, one feature of invasion can be these pointed, uh, angulated, sharply angulated glands. Uh, one feature could be stromal reaction or tissues that are where they do not belong, such as here, juxtaposed a uh, medium-sized vessel, uh, maybe pose, posing into the stroma as single small groups of cells. So this then begins to raise our concern for invasive neoplasia uh, into the stock. In these circumstances, of course, you want to see if you can evaluate the stock uh, if it's present to determine whether or not neoplasia has extended uh, anywhere close to the stock. And we don't have an inked uh, examinable stock in this situation. Here's another area sort of in between, but I think also would be classified as high grade dysplasia based on the almost uh, uh, total loss of mucin and the very high grade. Uh, appearing nuclei, the papillarity, and the diathesis that's present here. Let's go on to another example. Um, uh, this is another uh, sort of more tubulovillus type of lesion. We see some uh, glandular structures and some villus changes here. And again, here at intermediate power, you can see the difference between this cytology and what's here. Uh, so we'll go at higher magnification and compare those uh, one to the other. Uh, here's our sort of low-grade dysplasia, here's our high-grade dysplasia. Uh, seen back-to-back, -back, it's fairly easy to identify this. Uh, we begin to see the crib reforming a type of change, individual cell necrosis, uh, carioreptic debris, uh, luminal contents with uh, dirty uh, inflammatory diathesis type of stuff uh, right here. And those are all very helpful features in defining high-grade dysplasia. Once you've asked that question, then of course, if you are answered that question, do I have high grade dysplasia? You wanna answer the question of whether or not you have invasion. Here's more diathesis, more cribriform features here, uh, but we don't have very much stock in this lesion uh, to examine in that piece, but in this piece, we do. And here we see an ink dot at the uh, distal stock margin, uh, a normal uh, muco mucosa here, and here we see some stuff that looks like it's where it doesn't belong. It's in the stock. Um, and uh, looking at this uh, tissue, we can see that this looks much more similar to that high-grade dysplasia. Uh, these cells are way too close to these large gaping vessels, um, and they're positioned without an accompanying muscularis mucosa. So this is early invasive adenocarcinoma invading the uh, lamina propria and invading the submucosa uh, beneath the muscularis mucosa that's going to lead to the, the margin of this polyp. Now, uh, measuring that distance is important uh, to define, again, the, the relative risk uh, for uh, distant metastasis and so forth. So this is another nice example of a tubulovillus adenoma up here on the surface, and we see that. Um, areas of high-grade dysplasia here along this, the margins. Uh, here, 
here, and then an invasive carcinoma involving the stalk. Take another example. Uh, here's another uh, example we can see of sort of villus-like architecture. Um, but this is a little bit jagged, and it raises the concern right off the bat for whether or not we have invasion. Uh, here we see some muscularis mucosa, but here we see some stromal reaction uh, to this. Uh, so this is not normal muscularis mucosa. This looks like we're beginning to get a, uh, an invasive, reactive uh, appearing uh, type tissue. Let's look over at this other piece. Uh, and again, here we can see a little bit of muscularis mucosa here. Uh, but it sort of fades out a little bit and it becomes more difficult to identify. Now, we didn't answer the question as to whether there was high-grade dysplasia here, um, but if we look at a few of these areas, I think maybe we'll be able to come to that conclusion. So here's a few examples right here. Um, intermediate dysplasia here, more high-grade dysplasia up here with this uh, more cribriform type architecture. Um, maybe a little bit more suggestive of high-grade dysplasia here. And of course, this is not a, an open and shut situation, but it's uh, the circumstance where you have a gradation uh, and a progressive uh, feature that uh, can be seen. Now looking over here, we see there's a nice uh, comfortable ink dot here. And uh, again, here we would wonder, uh, is this an area of invasive neoplasia that is uh, coming towards our cauterized margin? Here we see some muscularis mucosa over here with normal mucosa. Uh, here's our cauterized margin at the base. And here's what appears to be potentially invasive tumor. Uh, we see some incomplete glands here, for example. Nice example of that here. Uh, epithelium, mucin, no epithelium and mucin. Epithelium, again, over here, an incomplete gland uh, in that area. So uh, invasive carcinoma. Uh, closely approaching the cauterized margin, uh, maybe even present at the cauterized margin over here. Uh, this is a lesion where we would assume the risk of uh, metastatic disease uh, may be sufficient to warrant further surgery. And finally, another example, uh, again, a very polypoid lesion, a rounded tufted surface polyp. And you can imagine getting a biopsy of this and making the diagnosis of you know, tubular adenoma uh, if they're only able to snag the surface, or maybe a tubulovillus adenoma. Uh, but as we look at this, um, the center of this lesion looks suspect. There's too many glands down here. And as we begin to evaluate this, we see that these uh, there's not a good defined muscularis mucosa. We begin to have a uh, stromal desmoplastic response here. Um, these cells are way too close to large vessels. There's uh, free-floating mucin in some areas here. Uh, and again, these are just way too close here. And see this desmoplastic stroma. So here we have uh, invasive carcinoma, again, closely approaching the cauterized margin here, as you see there, are arising from uh, what looks on the surface to be a tubulovillus adenoma. So we haven't even seen the high-grade dysplasia. We've already found the cancer. Um, where is the high-grade dysplasia? Well, we may not always see it. Um, it may be focal. It may have happened in one of the deeply displaced glands, um, because in this particular case, we do not see um, a tubular villus. We do not see the, the high-grade dysplasia right off the, the, the bat. But we do see what is clearly invasive tumor involving the stalk and extending towards the margin. Well, this has been a nice summary for you of uh, sort of a tour through the various polypoid lesions. Uh, that we can encounter in the uh, uh, colon. Um, I would invite you to check the links in the uh, uh, notes below and uh, come back and view the entire presentation. Look at the slides individually. Uh, they are annotated. They'll have some guidance for you. So please spend some time studying them. Uh, and if, of course, as always, if you have questions, don't hesitate to send me an email or uh, a Twitter link. Um, and of course, I hope that you'll subscribe and catch up on additional videos that uh, may be posted uh, in the coming days. Thanks for joining me for this uh, tour through some of the basics of uh, colon polyps. I hope it's been helpful to you.
and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you and talking to you again soon.